Hi, my name is Holden Russell and I'm here at the Mission Gate Foundation today to interview team members who recently returned from a missions trip to the Solomon Islands. Mission Gate's international program, Walking Free, has been working since 2020 to bring capacity in the form of a prosthetic and orthotic lab to the people of the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. After building a state-of-the-art P&O lab inside of a 40-foot shipping container, Mission Gate then shipped the container to the other side of the world. As planned, it was placed at the Kalufi Hospital on the island of Malaita. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from the three team members who traveled 19 flight hours and a 15-hour time difference to provide follow-up training and education to the Solomon Islands prosthetists and rehabilitation providers. This team was the perfect combination of physical therapists and prosthetists to guide the in-country team and make this overall project successful and most importantly, sustainable. Let's hear from them now. Hi, I'm David Lawrence, founder and CEO of the Mission Gate Foundation and also founder of the Walking Free program. Hi, my name is Hunter Bogert. I'm a physical therapist and I work here at the Gate Center. Hello, my name is Chris Stokesbury. I'm a certified prosthetist and orthotist working here in the Richmond, Virginia area. So walk me through the process of getting off the plane in the Solomon Islands and traveling to the hospital. So the process of getting off the plane in the Solomon Islands really uh, was uh, after 19 hours of flying with these two. And uh, so it was an experience and a lot of time on an airplane. Uh, went through Fiji and then uh, what, 15 hours of time change. So yeah, I was pretty, my head was pretty jacked up. Uh, but uh, got there, fantastic. I think it was sometime mid morning, late morning, uh, noon time. Uh, the airport was a very simple little airport. We were the only plane that I saw uh, come in at that time. Looked like they probably had some, but limited airport. Uh, the team on the other end was fantastic. Uh, our colleagues from the Ministry of Health uh, in the Solomon Islands, just fantastic folks. They were at the airport waiting for us. We had Lays coming. Mm -hmm. It was really quite cool. Uh, jumped on a van that they brought from the uh, hospital, uh, NRH they call it, National Rehabilitation Hospital, and took us to the hotel. The um, road system, if you've ever been in a country like that, is pretty uh, chopped up. Uh, so it was, a, it was a bumpy ride and yeah. it poured. I mean, literally cats and dogs. Uh, it was heavy rain uh, all the way to the hotel. Um, once we got to the hotel, very kind of Polynesian looking place. Uh, it was fantastic. So uh, great folks, uh, wonderful pickup, went as smooth as it could possibly have gone from my standpoint. I agree, Yeah, absolutely. So our, from our standpoint, we, you know, we were both the hospital NRH, and that is in the capital city of Honiara, and, uh, and that's the main hospital. But where the prosthetic laboratory is housed is over in the little uh, city of Alki mm -hmm. on a different island of Malaita. Mm -hmm. And that was a two-hour boat ride on a, on a very uh, fast, yeah, <laughs> excellent uh, kind of hydroplane, uh, um, what they call it, catamaran boat. Yeah. Catamaran um, it was awesome, smooth as can be, fantastic uh, ride getting over there. And then you're stepping into an, a, another world, uh, e even uh, less, uh, um, I guess, developed. Yeah. Uh, and, but it was amazing. Again, wonderful folks start to finish. Uh, ask about language. Uh, Luckily, uh, they all speak English to some degree, um, which is great. <laughs> um, they have a mix of you know, something they call pigeon, uh, and that's kind of their language. It's kind of, um, if you've been in Haiti, it's kind of Creole. It's kind of a half mix of some French, some English, some American. That was pretty much uh, English and a mix of other, uh, I guess, native language. But you, you can pick it up for the most part. He picked it up really quick. Yeah, uh, he was talking that uh, really well. By the end, we were all still more confused. That's right. It's, it's pretty confusing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but for the most part, you know, it's like a broken English, so it's not too bad. Awesome, great. Okay, so once you arrived on site at the prosthetic lab, what were you trying to accomplish as a team? So what was, you know, walk me through each of your roles individually and what you did um, to support that team in uh, Solomon Island. I guess as the, the guy that's, uh, you know, kind of heading up the thing, the, the beginning of the process was to educate their PT staff uh, over at the main hospital in Honiara and then uh, and see some patients as follow-ups as the, our lab had opened uh, about five or six months earlier. Um, so we were assess assessing the work that had already been done. Um, and then traveling over and beginning that process over again, over in, uh, in Malaita at uh, Kalufi Hospital, which is where the lab actually sits. 
So my job was to kind of get that educational process started, really have a hunter from the standpoint of the PT engage with the uh, CBR workers, community-based rehab workers and therapists. And um, on the uh, same light from the standpoint of the prosthetic, having uh, an orthodontic side, having Chris really connect with Wilfred, the uh, prosthetist that's there, and try to, again, assess where they were, come and bring them up to the level that we wanted them to be as quickly as possible. So I'll let you guys kind of talk about what you do with the therapists and prosthetist. Yeah, so the, the first day that we got there, we didn't do anything. The second day after resting up, we went over to the hospital in Honiara, the one that David mentioned, NRH, and we worked with the staff there. Um, basically what I was doing was working with their CBR workers, but also with, um, they, they would call themselves like physiotherapists there, so physios. And um, really just training them in how we would start off with bed exercise to worry about getting someone up to speed sort of with where their strength is at to be able to use a prosthesis effectively in gait training. So really worked with them on, on bed exercises, level exercises. And um, the biggest thing there was just getting hands on, getting passionate about what you do, getting hands on and bringing energy to the table. There's sort of a, um, a general like just island time mentality sort of thing where people are more laid back, less hands on, kind of, oh, you go for it, you know, I'll, I'll be over here. And we just kind of wanted to break that right off the boat with them and just get them like, no, you got to be on these patients and you got to really work for this. So that was a big part of really what we were all doing the whole time, but a, definitely a huge part of what I was doing, working with the uh, CBR and the physios there. So after that, we then went over to Klufi Hospital on the Malaita province and then kind of redoing that whole process again with the CBR workers over there at that hospital. So that was mostly my involvement. Absolutely. Yeah, as, as Hunter alluded to, we, we worked both with um, new patients, so those who were coming to be evaluated for their health check, their general health check for their um, qualification for their prosthesis. Uh, we also worked with existing patients that were seen um, when the previous team had initially gone over. Um, and then we were also working with um, patients who needed uh, adjustments. I guess those are yeah, the, the same, same, same crew on that second set of people. But um, as, as, the, as the new patients were coming through to be evaluated um, and they would be passed on to, to myself for um, prosthetic analysis, whether we're casting um, or adjusting their, their current prosthesis, that's what, that was my uh, main focus um, in both locations, along with checking in, doing almost like a temperature check with Wilfred, the, the uh, CPO that's over there, the certified prosthetist, orthodontist that's over there, uh, just to see where he's at, checking on the work that he's doing, um, if there's any um, consistent things that maybe he's doing that need um, slight adjusting, um, or uh, if there's things that we can continue to kind of support him on that he's doing very well. And the result was he was doing extremely well. There were very little uh, minor changes that were needed um, for these excellent results for um, the, the um, Solomon people there. Yeah. I guess there's a little bit more to that. Like Chris yeah. mentioned, I didn't really talk about it. We were doing assessment of patients too, so some of the amputees and people with limb loss there, kind of running them through, okay, where's their base kind of – Base level strength is, do they have any contractures or basically joints that aren't full range of motion because they've gotten tight over time sitting. Um, doing some of that and looking at then at also at their like metabolic and endocrine sort of health and the internal side of things because run into a lot of diabetes over there and that's it's pretty rampant. Um, and so we really had to look at blood sugar levels and kind of how well managed are they there and also what kind of accompanies that a lot of the time is blood pressure issues. So just running through kind of the mix of those two and then any other health conditions that they're dealing with. But so looking at assessment on a lot of the patients too. Yeah, I think from the global standpoint or the larger scope is we didn't want to make assumptions as to their level of knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, Wilfred had been trained at a school, an ISPO, International Society of Prosthetics and Orthotics School in Jaipur, India. And so, again, we didn't know where that 
stood as far as, you know, educated, but what kind of skills. Yeah. And the therapists, we didn't know how many actually physios there would be that were trained in uh, internationally accredited programs, and there was more than we thought. Mm -hmm. And then quite a few CBR workers, which means it's a little more kind of associate degree or on the job training as well. So it was just a lot of this was assessing where are they? Where, you know, we don't want to make assumptions of that, and I think we were all pretty impressed that they Absolutely. were really much stronger than we thought they would be. They just didn't have the resources. They didn't yeah. have the the ability to move patients forward in this way. Um, and yeah. so that's a lot of what Walking Free is about: bringing them the capacity, bringing them the resources to take their talent yeah. and let them run with it. That's yeah. Great. Well said. Good. Awesome. All right. So this is specifically for Chris. Okay. Um, as someone who works in a prosthetics lab on probably a daily basis, how does your lab in Richmond compare to the prosthetics lab that we shipped to these on islands? Yeah, it felt just, yeah, there was, there was no, um, what do you call it? No step down, no step. It was the yeah, e even transition, if that makes sense. Um, felt like I was at home. <laughs> it was quite nice, uh, the, the team putting together the, the lab. Um, every, every tool was in there that we needed to get the job done. So it was um, encouraging to see that, um, that Wilfred had all the tools that he needed to um, help the Solomon people there with their prosthetic and orthotic needs. Great, all right. So this last one, I want everyone to kind of give your own answer. Um, it's what is something you learned from this trip that changes your perspective about fabricating prosthetics and their effect on the community? Or it could be PT and their effect on the community. So I want you guys to kind of go down the line and we can start with Chris. So just like how does this trip kind of change your perspective about it? Yeah, I think this trip specifically, kind of like what I was sharing earlier, just encouraged me that, hey, there is a model that, that can be truly sustainable and to david's point mm -hmm. of course i've heard that word before like we all have and thought about what is it what could it look like and i think this is um it was encouraging to experience what it, what it looks like and, and what what a model like that is um, i think one of the other things that is um, stood out the most i guess or take take back with me on this is the idea and seeing that Yes, we bring education and practical steps and then also just um, hand skills and things like that for the prosthetic and the therapy side, um, but also the momentum, as David mentioned, that's I think probably one of the biggest things that we're bringing into this because, at, because of how this is set up, they had to have skin in the game. So that's really what their, their own ability and, and desire to want to provide this care for their people that's what's going to that's what's going to make it sustainable. So if that's at the beginning, which is how this whole thing is built on an invitation, meaning they want to put skin in the game, I think that that's what's driving this entire thing. So of course, it makes it easy for um, it, it makes it easy to see what areas that are needing help, and that was it was neat to be able to to see. Okay, great. This is where we provided help um, for the areas that they needed it, and and watching them continue on with the help that they've received. Just a kind of a beautiful uh, picture there. Yeah, I guess for me, um, it was more about developing or framing a mindset about what it can look like instead of maybe changing it mm -hmm. more so. So what I realized is that I guess like any mission trip, the goal is to make the biggest impact you can. Yeah. And what's so unique about this setup with walking free and with the container system is you can set something in place that's sustainable and reproducible as well. So there, it's being sustained, just like everyone's mentioned, like this just keeps going. Like it's not just when we come, we're like a little jump start to everything mm -hmm. there. Absolutely. And they're already going and we're just like, yeah, and now here we bring in this and we're gonna educate you here and give you this and this and this and you're doing a great job. Now take this and run with it and do it better and do more. And so it's sustainable. But then it's also reproducible, and this can be done in so many places. And so when you get back to that goal of having the biggest effect, positive effect on an area, now you take it from what maybe you could have had a positive effect on one to say like five countries in decades, you now can do t tens of countries in decades. And so you wanna have the biggest impact possible, right? And so if you, maybe look at your life with the way traditional mission trips are set up. You think, okay, I can affect 
and uh, impact uh, you know x amount of countries in this amount of time and it's not a very large number you know maybe one country every year and you have to go back to somewhere you've already been because things fall apart and this and that well now with this with this setup um this sort of uh way of doing it with a container system and and getting countries to really say hey we want this instead of you coming in and saying no we want this for you the countries themselves saying no we want this for ourselves and so there's a lot more initiative and responsibility involved and so you take what could have impacted a small amount of uh, countries in your lifetime to now hey i can have an impact on a sustaining impact on a way larger amount of countries and so you just you take like almost people will talk about their legacy right you're just upscaling that legacy you're able to leave a much bigger impact on the world and so i think that's what's sort of eye-opening to myself in this situation yeah i think it's right on i think that the this is a replicable idea and every other walking free center uh, i have built them in place in country and honestly it took years to, to get done what we did in six months building out this replicable uh, container laboratory. And then we could drop it in place and it's a plug and play system. It's literally plug it in, hook up the water supply and it can run. Yeah. So if they've educated on their part, educated their person, uh, really they're ready to roll right out of the gate. And where that would take you know, four or five years as we're building up some capacity. So uh, Hunter's exactly right. Th this replicable idea, if the resources are there, and that's really the only thing that holds us back on this one, is now we can replicate this idea and build multiple container labs. We can bring up capacity in, in numerous countries, almost sequentially or in, uh, overlapping, um, and not have to be like, well, no, we're going to have to, you know, a few more years in this country before we can even think about something somewhere else because of how much time it takes and in-country work. So that's really, really important. Um, so the replicable idea, I think, is a, a big changer for me. As far as, you know, kind of looking at how does this shape my thought process, you know, going forward, uh, you know, having done this for 20 plus years, you know, I've seen a lot of things. And so it's it's was very similar. I mean, when you look in a, you know, a, curl, a world that's kind of a developing country, it's, it's not that different. Um, around the world, uh, be that in, in Haiti or, or be that in the Solomon Islands or you know some different areas. So, um, but I would say what one of the things that really shapes for me is exciting is that you know three of us started this process. I, I began walking free, but very soon on brought on a guy named Gilberto Mejia, um, which is a prosthetist, and uh, Gail Grizzetti, which is a more like an academian um, a physical therapist. And between the three of us kind of built what is walking free. So part of what is exciting for me is coming back after, you know, um, hanging out with these guys uh, for a week and being on the plane and seeing the next generation of, of you know, people that needs to, you know, people like us are, are getting to the point where, you know, Gil's older than myself. Gail has passed, unfortunately, due to uh, cancer. And to be able to pass the torch to people that are wanting that torch. <laughs> Not like, oh, yeah, no, yeah, no don't, uh, <laughs> you know, no thanks. Uh, and it was really exciting to see them jump in with both feet, you know, and get, hey, I've got this. This just honestly reminds me of what, what we were like years ago, where, you know, you're learning it as you go, and it's, and it's super cool. So I am excited about the future because the replicable idea is only as good as the people to work on it. Yeah. So you can give labs all you want, but if there aren't the people out there to work on it and, right. and really committed and interested in saying, hey, we can, we can make that impact and we should make that impact. <laughs> That's another real big issue, right? My father always taught us early on that too much is given, much is expected. And in this country, everyone, a lot has been given. Yeah. So I think the opportunity to say, hey, we can do something and we should do something. Yeah. And here's an opportunity to do so. And I think this is just, it's been exciting for me to, to look at this next generation of guys coming up and, and, and folks and say, hey, this, we, are, we are good with this. We're gonna go places with this. And uh, so, for that, that's the, the big takeaway for me, is, is really exciting. What's the next step? The next step is to, to them to get more independence and, and gain more notoriety and uh, motivation, uh, um, momentum towards improvement, uh, for me is to go at the educational level, go up to what we call an international symposium. Uh, in our Central American countries, we help start something called Uniting Frontiers. 
and we brought the different countries together and to show, hey, here's the work that's being done in this area, hey, and it can be done other places as well, and here's how that process occurs. They can share knowledge, they gain confidence, and the people that already have some capacity now are like going, hey, well, actually, we're doing really pretty good, better than a lot of folks, and that gives them a lot of confidence. And the others go like, well, if they can do it, then this possibly could occur, move forward. We were also in the Middle East, there's something called um, the um, Pan-Arab Congress, uh, that we were part of as well as far as education but again bringing in that area between the folks in that region to say how can we help each other educate each other and move the process forward so the next step for us is to help them sponsor an international symposium in the solomon islands and vote their uh, invite their colleagues and uh, counterparts from all around the south pacific region bring in our friends from australia japan even new zealand to help with education do some of the edu initial educational training but just like uniting frontiers over time this occurs every year or two you know the education becomes less us and more them <laughs> And then we have less of us there, and they're more educating each other. And, and again, these programs are still exist today, and I'm hoping the South Pacific will be no different, that 20 years from now, they'll still be running programs, educational programs in the South Pacific, really helping to educate each other as we can advance that capacity uh, throughout the entire region. Because truly, Solomon Islands is just one country in this situation. There is 90% of the countries in that area, well, 80% of the countries in that area are in the same situation. I mean, outside of New Zealand and, and Australia, Japan, you're really dealing with the same process all over that area.